Hi everyone, this is Elizabeth Wood, and I'm so glad to introduce you to my dear friend, Victoria Moore, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing before. But now, of course, is a new time. It's a special time. And Victoria is going to really help us to understand why this time is so precious. So thank you so much, Victoria, for joining us on this New Earth Conversation. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So I just love this, this beautiful concept you've brought to the table that a lot of people are very flustered at the moment. They're getting pulled in all directions with information. They're finding themselves uh, truly confused. Mm. They're spinning out. Mm -hmm. As we often mm -hmm. like to say in mysticism, people will spin out. They get pulled in different directions and polarities and their internal relationships are in a tumult. Everything seems to be in a large chaotic mess. But at the moment, you are teaching and sharing the concept that this jumbly soup is actually the most precious time for creation. Can you elaborate on the concept of the chrysalis and how we got to this sort of primordial chaotic soup mess and what we can <laughs> Perfect description. Well, it's not like we screwed up so badly that we got ourselves in this primordial chaotic mess. <laughs> the way I look at these things is, and my perception and my experience is that while it may look like something really awful has had, happened on the planet and, oh gosh, there's this agenda, that agenda, this responsibility, all kinds of places to blame, people to blame, uh, circumstances to blame. But actually, it wouldn't be happening if it was not in the highest destiny, or dharma, to use the uh, Sanskrit term, uh, for, for humanity. And the way I see it is that we have functioned at a certain level, we have functioned primarily from our minds. We have functioned, you know, that's third dimension. That's, if you're thinking chakras, that's third chakra, the solar plexus. And that's happened for thousands of years. And we, as humanity, are slated for a serious upgrade. And what's happening right now is what's necessary for that upgrade to happen. Um, you know, for many years, many years, uh, we've talked in the, in the mystical and spiritual world, we've talked about how a caterpillar goes through a stage where it's, you know, it's, an, it's a happy little caterpillar and it's, you know, eating leaves and it's scooting along the branch and all of a sudden, you know, it takes hold of a branch, <laughs> goes into this chrysalis phase and then comes out a butterfly. We've talked about this in terms of personally with your evolutionary process. You know, you'd be bumping along, you'd be having experiences, you'd be learning things, and all of a sudden you crash. <laughs> you have like a dark night of the soul. And, um, but if you can go with it, uh, you find you come out on the other side in a more advanced or a more evolved state of consciousness. Well, this is happening at a really global level right now this situation you know uh when it started it was very clear to me it, we were we were in a reset we were starting a reset but now this has gone on for months and months and everybody people who've never meditated as well as people who are longtime spiritual seekers or advanced um, mystics we are all in the same position, which is that we don't know what's going to happen next. And the mind, right? Remember I said we've been 
functioning as a mental body. Well, the mind is not happy with that. <laughs> the mind is not, the mind would rather make up stories, disaster stories, apocalypse stories, whatever, so that it can feel like it knows what's happening and it's in control. And what I see is that we are in a stage right now where we've talked for years about being present. Well, guess what? That's all you can do right now is be fully present. We can't be focusing on the past other than to the extent that we know it's not looking like things are going to go back to the way they were. We can't focus on the future because we have been having an experience day by day by day that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when, you know, the virus or whatever will have run its course. We don't know um, how much longer we'll have to be wearing masks or whatever. We just don't know. And that's the state of being in the chrysalis, being in the soup. You know, when a caterpillar, I'm sure, you know, if, if you asked a little caterpillar just as he kind of, you know, he followed his innate guidance to sequester, sequester, right, on that leaf or that twig or whatever. But if you were to tell that little caterpillar, guess what? you are going to be completely morphed into something else. And you're going to have to sit there and let yourself be completely turned into formless mush for some period of time. I don't know how many, you might have a lot of caterpillars jumping off the twig and suiciding at that point. <laughs> but, you know, they have this little inner knowing because they're such a, and the innate part of nature, that they have to go forward with it. Well, yeah. we are now, we are in this phase where all of the events and the activities and the beliefs about what happens next that were the parameters of our reality, boop, gone. They're just gone. And so what I keep encouraging everybody to do is to make peace with being in the unknown. Because basically, if you are looking to awaken and you're looking to go into the higher states of samadhi, nirvikalpa samadhi, let's say, that's where you are going is into the void, the total unknown. Unknown. It's th there... It's, it's prior to frequency. It, there's nothing, right? So um, this is like a, 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 a similar kind of experience in that we're in this void space where we don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, and it's interesting because spirit has, you know, really uh, made this real for me. You know, I live in South Africa and I came here for a short visit <laughs> and I went to visit a friend of mine my friend Lucia in Ecuador at the beginning of March. And I left one world and I came back to an entirely different world. And I just got out of Ecuador a day before they closed their borders. Yeah. And I got back to the States and I don't have a home in the States anymore. So I have been in some ways essentially homeless and I have, you know, I've had places to stay. And right now I have a, a lovely little, pretty postage stamp of a place to stay. But I have no idea when or if I'll get back. So I have actually gotten to live in a very visceral way what I'm talking about. You know, it's like day by day. All we can do is be very, very present. And in being present, we are being given an opportunity to actually become very authentic, very real and begin to know who we are beyond all of those parameters that we uh, identified ourselves as before. So it's amazing, fantastic time. And rather than, and it's very tempting, of course, 
to latch on to one theory, one agenda or another. And boy, they're being pushed really hard. But if we can just remain in the I don't know and be open and available to all possibilities, we are actually taking the mystical path that, that honors our capacity to co-create reality. Now that's a very big topic. It's been slung around in spiritual and mystical circles for a long time. I don't think, I can't even begin to you know, speak to it because it's a much vaster and much grander um, situation. But suffice it to say, um, if we are open to all possibilities, we are actually allowing the divine spirit, that who we really are, to participate in manifesting whatever is highest. I, I guess I have a trusted relationship with spirit, with the universe. Um, you know, 50 years of meditating and lots of spiritual study and lots of egoic processing work contribute to that capacity. But the energies are such now that anybody who's willing to just go, okay, let me take this time to really get real with myself and be really authentic and, and, um, you know, and allow for all possibilities. Allow that, you know, instead of that polarity of uh, hoping for the best and fearing the worst, just go, okay, whatever happens, it is in spirit's design. It is in the divine design. And uh, so I think this chrysalis time is amazing, fantastic. I don't think it's all that close to being over, I would have to say, because until you can get comfortable with it, it's not going to shift. You know, the more we rebel against it, there's a lot of that rebel going on these days, but the more we rebel against it, the more we go, eh, it's going to stop. That is, you know, it's going to, I mean, there's that saying, what, what you resist persists. It's kind of like that. I mean, I think the lesson for humanity is to trust, to, to, to evolve that relationship with the divine, trust the divine, and be open to what the potentials are. I mean, you know, um, you could just take an example of, uh, I was talking to, I was doing a session with somebody who works in the school system and she has two young boys. And she was kind of bemoaning the fact that they're, you know, they're having to wear masks and having to be behind plastic and they can't play like, you know, they don't have recess play time where they're, you know, uh, wrestling around and all of that. And um, she was, you know, kind of worried about their inability to communicate. And I said, well, yeah, but maybe there's a new level of communication maybe their innate capacity to communicate psychically will be fostered. I mean, we don't know. We don't know. Um, we do know that we have found that, uh, you know, pretty much everything that runs the world can be done on Zoom. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, uh, there are just all kinds of possibilities that being willing to be in the chrysalis will make us available to. So, and, and I, I, I don't think I'm speaking in any airy fairy way. I think that it's just, you know, I know that the human being is capable. We have so much more in us. We have the knowledge of the universe in every single frigging cell. And um, this is an opportunity here a golden opportunity to uh, move into 
our next state of consciousness, you know, humo, what, humo, uh, homo luminous is what one of my friends calls it. That's a good one. Yeah, that was Leslie's term for it, homo luminous. Um, and I, I, I feel like that, that's why we're here, is to, you know, uh, support that, support that. But at a practical level, what's the best thing we can do? The best thing we can do is get okay with the fact that we don't know. And rather than hook on to some story about what's going to happen, bad or good, just be available and trust. Trust in the divine. Trust in ourselves. Yeah, definitely. I find that in this not knowing, there's so much more miraculous mm. that unfolds. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm trying to cultivate not knowing, which is really hard for me because I'm a seer. It's kind of like my job to try to know stuff. <laughs> but at the same time, um, w whenever I think I know something, it completely uh, limits all the, right. all the miracles that are possible. So I've been practicing by taking my knowing, loving it as it is, and letting it go it, from my heart, giving it back to source, to the divine, and saying, you're more creative than me. Source divine is more creative than me. Um, my, my mind is so limited. Well, that's, yeah, that's, can I just... Yeah, please. Here? It's the mind that's limited, not who you are. You are source. We all are. Every single one of us on this planet is and has an aspect of ourselves that is there, you know, that is right there. And our job is to embody that, is to, is to um, actually train the mind to see who we really are and let us be who we really are. And, you know, as a seer, you know that, yes, we can see possibilities, but there are multiple possibilities. And when we hook into one particular possibility, we, we're doing, we're limiting all these others from taking, from occurring. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, it's really hard to, um, as I'm sure you've seen, predictive is not the best way to use that ability to see. So I'm really glad to hear you say that because then you are, then you are not limiting the possibilities of what could happen. Yeah. And the other piece I've been noticing too is people will hook onto the story, which is sort of like a timeline. Mm. and they'll value one timeline over all others right and i keep reminding my mind and and my my beautiful community that all timelines are perfect because yeah. that they're of the divine that they're mm. all going home anyway every single one leads home that's right that's right <laughs> it's like uh, uh, there, I heard this phrase recently, you can't go wrong, you can just go long. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, everybody, everybody is on an evolutionary journey with their soul. And all the souls on the planet right now opted to be here for this event. That's the way I see it. And, and it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting time because if we're really present, in the present moment, we always have a choice. So we're at, we're at a moment where we can always choose whether to be afraid of what's happening or whether to love into it and love ourselves. You know, so it's, and, and it's a moment to moment. It's always been this way, by the way. It's just that the mind has not perceived it that way and has overlaid a story, mm -hmm. you know. Um, when I was uh, when I was writing an email recently, I found myself saying, "You know, we've ne we've never really known what the future was going to bring, 
but we, we did a pretty good job of selling ourselves on that. And yet, you know, you look and that's the most unhappy place to be. It's like, well, I'm going to grow old and then my, we're going to use our 501k that hopefully is still around and we'll do, be taking cruises or the other story of like, oh my God, I'll be on the street because I have to keep working until the day I die. You know, how do those stories make you feel? Not great. <laughs> exactly. Not great. Not great. And we, and we do, then we cut off, we cut off the incredible possibilities that are here. And no matter what the possibilities at the moment, you, you are teaching at the moment that the name of the game is embodiment. <laughs> right. It's right. the body that's, that's, that's got the authenticity of the, the homo luminous. Mm. It's mm. the body and the heart and the organs and the gut and all the cells and that this is the great, greatest tool we have for presence, for awareness, for enlightenment. And it's not just attaining enlightenment for the mind. <coughs> it's all about being in the body and a full body experience of light. And I think, you know, a good example is, is, is you, you're brighter, lighter, you, you're, you're younger looking, you're, your body has changed immensely and so has mine as we've been getting into the body mm -hmm. it's, it's something that i think um ancient times wasn't concerned about because they were using aestheticism to go direct into the samadhi experience and now it's it's a whole other game board could you talk about the importance of embodiment right now? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, it's music to my ears hearing you say this. <laughs> because when I first started talking about this with people uh, six, seven years ago, um, it wasn't quite hitting with a lot of people. And it's because we weren't quite there yet. But um, the way I see it is that for many thousands of years, and it wasn't wrong, but for many thousand of, thousands of years, the experience was to somehow achieve the ability to go up and reach into the realms, the higher realms, you could call them the higher dimensions. Um, those states in one tradition were called the samadhi states or satori states or you know degrees of enlightenment and it was one in which the uh, personality structure along with the body had to be transcended basically and uh, listen, when I first started meditating, that was still pretty much uh, because it was, I started meditating with a, you know, a Vedic tradition. And uh, that was the story. And the same was going with the Buddhist people who were doing, who were doing Buddhism. And um, even when I started studying with a American mystical teacher, Rama, he was very grounded from that position. He had his way of trying to bring it into the modern world um, that included high technology and all of that, but it was still, um, and, he, and he did emphasize, you know, having the body be robust and active and balanced, you know, intense meditation, intense mental, intense physical, <laughs> all at the same time. So that was valid, but it still didn't really address it. And then about a little over 20 years ago, when I reconnected with uh, my friend, Leslie Temple Thurston, who was a very powerful, spiritual, enlightened teacher. Um, you know, she said to me, she said, the, the, uh, what the guides are telling me, what my guides are telling me is that we're coming into a time where enlightenment has to be all the way in the body. And what I've seen about that is that 
there was there was a a perception that the body was somehow not that <laughs> the body was somehow um something to be tamed something to be you know not allowed to interfere with ascension and that may have been okay for a time when it was a this world was functioning as a third dimensional world and it we had our saints and we had our sadhus and we had our um Christ and we had our Buddha and our Muhammad and and of course you know interestingly Buddha said anybody can be a Buddha Christ said I'm just paraphrasing <laughs> you know all that I can you can do anything that I can do and more and we didn't listen to that part <laughs> we just we didn't quite get that part and what they were saying 2000 3000 years later we're getting that humanity is this amazing species that has uh, at a it, we're just a quantum we're a quantum being we're pure energy all of existence is energy in various forms of, it anchors at various forms right and this this whole uh, universe is one of expansion and contraction or anchoring expansion and anchoring and for humanity to move into its next level of consciousness this understanding which has always been true but has not been perceived here really not really um is essential and you know like the stars are in our favor i mean the the, the part of the universe that we are catapulting through right now is feeding billions of bits of information into our cells every millisecond and this is a good way to think about it the soul communicates to the belly and or the body and the mind needs to be able to gain the information from the brain and the belly and the brain and the heart in order to use it as the higher faculties of the mind the higher brain centers so this is a time when learning how to not just like for years and years gosh I have to backtrack a little bit um, when i first started meditating i was traditional vedic mantra meditation but at a certain point, I just found myself going, I just, I just want to go in. I know what it feels like when I transcend. I just want to do that. And what I was doing was just bringing my awareness into the center of the brain, the cave, what's known in, in the tradition as the cave of Brahma or the cave of Brahman, which is really the corpus callosum, right between right and left hemispheres, right between the front and the back. And I would just go in there and then I would have access to this, uh, the, this uh, core of light. Now, it's taken me many, many years to really ground. I have to admit that being very Vata, <laughs> my tendency was to be well, here, but, you know, but I still had, and I had had training my first career as a ballet dancer I had a teacher who was a mystic and she taught with energy so I I'd had some I don't know I'd had some inklings of all of this way back which was why when my friend said to me 23 years ago this is the time for consciousness or enlightenment to be all the way in the body the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I was like this is what I'm here for. And so I really made a study of it. I have, I have, you know, I've worked with processing the ego in the both mental and emotional ways. And now I'm really working with the limitations of the protective personality from an energy perspective in the body. And to me, 
at this point in time, this is the fastest way for any of us to know ourselves as not a, a human who has a soul or a body who can access the light and the flow of Kundalini, but that is our identity, that flow of light that comes into the earth, merges with Mother Earth. Hey, you know, we're this combination of stellar and earthly, right? Merges with Mother Earth, comes up through. This is how we get the upward and downward flowing Kundalini. But we are that light. We are the soul and our identity is as that presence that can emanate through a body. And in the last couple of years, because of the advances in quantum physics, because of the fact that there are a few people out there now who really know this much better than I do. I know what I know, have gained from my own experience, but it was not as easy to teach without being very abstract. But there are a couple of people out there who have the science and the spirituality and it's really merging. It's really merging, you know, the science, the left brain and the spirituality, the intuitive, creative, right brain, you know, that's, that's how we will move into homo luminous. So, so yeah, so it's to me, this is like the most exciting time. I'm so glad to be here. I always knew from, uh, from early on, gosh, you know, I started teaching meditation in that Vedic tradition. Um, I think I was about 23 or 24. And I always, and then I taught, you know, when I was working with Rama, I taught people. And when I worked with Leslie, I taught people. But I always knew that my gig here on the planet was really going to kick in towards the end what I would have at that point called the end times. And that's really what's happened. It's like, we're ready for this. It's very understandable. When you understand quant quantum science, I mean, like Rama would say, what you focus on, you become. And that's, that's a cool concept and it's a little bit abstract. And also the ew. The egoic mind can play with that one. Oh, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Oh, right. But um, another way to put it that I think is much more understandable to everybody is when we bring our awareness to any place in our field, in our body, we are bringing photon density to it. And a photon is, uh, it, it's, in quantum, you know, in the understanding of the quantum field, it is a, it, it has the capacity to uh, act as either pure energy or matter. It's that merging point. To me, it's like the causal plane, the merging of formless with form. It can behave in either way. And there's a lot of, you know, research that has been done to understand that point. And you know, it's not going to just stop. The quantum understanding is going to become more and more and more subtle. So who knows in five years what we might know. But at this point, what we can say is when we bring our awareness to something, we are bringing photon density. We are bringing the capacity for energy and matter merged, you know, energy becoming matter to whatever we're focusing on. So this whole realm of work of knowing ourselves as this energy and working with wherever we find there are places where the circuitry is not in place, there are blockages, is um, to me, it's where it's at at this point. And I'm mm -hmm. very excited to be working with it <laughs> and it's yeah yeah so. <laughs> I love that uh, awareness and and in science um, the observer mm -hmm. how powerful the observer is the then you know kind of recent science pointing at how the observer creates reality through observation 
Right. And, and then the testing out of that concept, literally proving how powerful our attention truly is. And I, and I keep trying to nail it home with my community and telling them you are, when you put your precious attention on something, it gives it form. Right. That's exactly, that's the photon, photon yeah. density piece. I mean, part of what you're talking about is this is the understanding is the act of observation affects the observed. It changes it. Mm -hmm. If, if, if it's, if those cells or, you know, quantum waves or those atoms are just bopping along without anybody paying attention to them, they'll do one thing. But if there is the attention being placed on them, that affects them. So this is kind of our initial understanding of this amazing capacity to co-create. And, uh, but rather than try and, you know, become an, a perfect co-creator right now, better to just like re recognize, okay, when I bring my awareness to something, I'm actually feeding energy to it. I'm actually affecting it. And I, each of us, you, me, everybody, we all have this capacity. And we can all um, be, you know, a, a beneficial influence on the planet. A, you know, if that's what we choose. And of course, bottom line is choosing love, choosing self-love, and, um, you know, how can we love the divine if we don't love ourselves? Because we are the divine. Yeah. It's so, and it's that's, so one of those, that's one of those separation mm -hmm. mm, paradigm busting things that uh, is not easy. It's not easy for, for us with the way we've been brought up and the way our religions have taught us. Um, to accept, but if, if we can begin to experience, you know, that's the thing with working with the body, you can actually viscerally experience this, these flows. We can viscerally experience how our field is bigger than the body and it's, and it's energy and it's movement, it's vibration and it's light and it's power. Um, when we can viscerally experience that, it begins the process of the mind um, letting the soul <laughs> be in charge. You know, and we have to do that by loving the mind, not chastising it or judging it or stopping it. You know, it's, it's okay, mind, just come here. Let me just love you a little bit and, you know, let you see that there's actually all the wisdom of the universe is in here. I don't have to go out there to tap into it because it's all in here. And our science would not be showing us that if we weren't ready to embrace it. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when I first started meditating all those years ago, Marishi was talking about that. He was talking about the quantum field being the field of pure consciousness. But that was like an, a learned concept for me, and I think most of us, because there wasn't the wealth of understanding about the quantum reality that there is now in our general population. But we are quantum beings. We are pure frequency. And the only way to really function from that is when you can feel that when you can experience it, when your sensory body can feel it. Mm. Otherwise, it's just concept. Mm. That's powerful. I like the idea of including ourselves in this um, loving <laughs> service, right? And, and then it's not just selfless service anymore. It becomes sovereign service. Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. I've heard you say that before. I like that. <laughs> Me too. And it's new. it was kind of new to me. Someone pointed that out. Are we leaving ourselves out? And I said, no. So I guess it's new now. It's something different. It's sovereign service. Um, and Elizabeth. Okay. Sorry. You just froze for a minute on my screen. I didn't want to lose you. 
Yeah, it's just the inclusion of the self and then the choice in the moment is where the sovereignty is, where the, the soul is choosing to be in the body, choosing to have the attention be on the body. And when the attention is on the body, the body becomes more light. That's, that's sort of the equation I'm hearing um, play out here. And would you say practically that that's true, that the idea right now is to really, really put our attention on the body in the now? Well, I can tell you that most of us, when we live our lives from the mind, we're very ungrounded. And there's actually been in the spiritual realm a, a kind of a prejudice against being grounded, except for those who are like, you know, Gaia lovers, <laughs> you know, because then there's this appreciation that this, our beautiful planet is this amazing uh, gift of grace, really. And being here on it at, at this transformational time is just, you know, it's so spectacular. I mean, if we have time, I'd love to share that experience of Gaia's, our, our channeling from Gaia on Mother's Day 2010. Uh, my friend Leslie Temple Thurston was sitting with a group of us um, on, the, on her deck in the Blader River Canyons, beautiful, um, so just I don't want to go into too much detail, but it's my it's my home in South Africa. It's a beautiful power spot. It is uh, a node along the Nilotic Meridian. You can look that up on Google, Nilotic Meridian, <laughs> and um, and it's uh, it's just very special, spectacular place. But we were sitting, and all of a sudden the energy shifted. And, um, you know, there you could, it's like space time just shifted a little bit and you could feel the breeze moving through the tree, the leaves in a crisper way. And it was like, there was this shift and all of a sudden she started this, she was not like into channeling. She was a very, in many ways, traditional spiritual teacher brought forward the whole marriage of spirit, um, mental and emotional uh, way of processing the egoic structure. But she was also a very, uh, you know, she had a really strong uh, right brain. She was an, a, an artist, a painter. And so she was a, a beautiful, uh, she, she, I mean, she still is, but she's not teaching anymore. But anyway, uh, all of a sudden she started channeling and she was channeling Gaia and it was Mother's Day. And the, the gist of it, I, I mean, I actually, on my website, I think I have a, a, a copy, a printout of what that channeling was. Um, but she basically was saying, what Gaia was saying, this was shortly after, uh, you know, that spill in the Gulf of Mexico we were all worked up about that. And she said, um, you know, don't worry about the scars on my body. She said, I am moving into a higher dimension. And you can come along with me if you want to. But you don't have to. It's your choice. But if you want to, you need to give up your secular life and devote yourself to your, um, I don't know if she called it spiritual life or whatever, but um, it took us a while to unpack that because what she was really saying is you have to give up your secular orientation and shift your awareness to the orientation of ascension because I'm ascending and I'll bring you with me. You know, you're invited to my coattails, but you have to do some work to do it in order to do it. And, um, I mean, that was essentially the message. There was more, uh, you know, she said, don't worry about the scars on my body. And she said, and she wasn't, uh, the message wasn't in any way um, chastising, but it was very, you know, it's up to you. You can come with me if you want to, but you have to change your orientation. 
And um, it was very, very powerful. But this is what's happening. This is what I'm seeing is she, you know, the, our planet, the vibration on our planet is, has been, this was before 2012. And of course, at that point in time, Leslie was seeing everything through the filter, you could say, of things were going to shift in 2012. And they did shift, but they didn't shift the way people were expecting it, or it didn't outpicture the way people were expecting it. I saw a huge doorway into greater heartfulness open up. And I noticed that at, at the 12, 21, 2012 time. But, but now you see the vibration of the planet has gone up so much that where you choose to focus it has much more impact than it did in 2010 or 2000 or whenever. So it's really, it's like, if we choose to just be, okay, this is where spirits put me right now, right? This is where I am right now and be present here and be present and be welcoming and allowing our identification as the fullness of who we truly are. Um, things can move so quickly. And if we find ourselves focusing in other ways, we can kind of go very quickly into the confusion and the fear. And, um, you know, it's very sim it's simplified to say it's a choice between fear and love, but simple is true. It's a choice between um, fighting what is or being present with what is. Mm. So, um, yeah, so that, that Mother's Day with Gaia was a pretty good indicator of what was going to be happening. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's quite yeah. amazing, quite stunning. I feel very, I actually have to admit, truth disclosure here, I, I got there a little late. It had already been going when I got there. <laughs> I think I was having some sort of rebelliousness with my friend Leslie, so I, I was late showing up. <laughs> but I, well, I got the benefit of it. I certainly felt what was, you know, I walked. It was like walking into another dimension. It really felt like a, a fifth. It was like she was speaking from a higher dimension. And it's great. It's beautiful. And we're so blessed. I love how you described it. Almost brought me to tears that the planet is this gift of grace mm -hmm. and so conscious and that the that the human body experience the homo sapien moving into homo luminous experience that that human body experience is not separate from nature it's not separate from the planet mm -hmm. it's so intimately woven it's almost like the earth is not here to help us, but our liberation is tied with the earth. Absolutely. It is. It is. I mean, w listen, right? You can't go wrong. You can only go long. <laughs> <laughs> so if, you, if, if, if it's not your soul's time, you won't. Yeah, in fact, you might, you know, choose to leave now, right? So there's no right wrong about all of this. But, but yeah, there is this opportunity if you are uh, guided in that direction or you are inspired in that direction. Yeah. I, I thought there was one other thing I, I was thinking of um, that you triggered in my awareness. Of course, now I'm kind of spacing on it. Um, about, you know, about what's going on right now. Um, Oh yeah, just that uh, we really are, uh, you know, we're made of the same minerals. So our physicalization, you know, when we, when we, when our, our divine light selves, our souls compressed through the dimensions into this physical dimension, um, we, you know, we were birthed from all the elements in Gaia. And 
as well as being this being that is, you know, at one level, we're all, you know, we, we're part of the, of the star, star system. And we're, uh, you know, you can think of um, the great central sun and the quantum field being one and the same. And uh, so everything, you know, everything that exists is part of the quantum field. Everything that exists is a manifestation from that level of the, what you could think of as the great central sun. So really science and spirituality are getting to be so close. It's amazing. And one of our great spiritual teachers was Einstein. <laughs> You know, he, he, he was, he was hip to this stuff. He knew what was, what oh, was yeah. coming, <laughs> but yeah. So the appreciation of the fact that we are made of star stuff and we are made of earth stuff. Um, and that really anchoring, we have to anchor this presence of who we are all the way into Gaia, all the way into it. Um, and, uh, and then we are, then we are grounding this luminous presence of who we really are. And that has, you know, that's in concert with her. And then her higher dimensional ascension moves right in through us. So it's pretty cool. And, and if you resist it, and I certainly have, um, and I've resisted being in my body, basically having spent, most of my life not in the body mm -hmm. and finally being tasked by my own teacher your friend Lucia to get in my body right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah get in it now or it's going to be taken away you know <laughs> yeah. and I and I had to this was so simple and yet profound in that I had to really learn what surrender means I had to allow source to make that choice in divinity, in that authentic divinity within me to make that choice. Am I going to limp along, it, just hanging out in my third eye, basically, <laughs> and suffering? Yeah, yeah. Am I going to die, or am I going to get in my body and take this opportunity? And... Um, in that surrendering, the choice ended up becoming being in the body. So there was a birthing back, not even back, there's a birthing into the body <laughs> that occurred and it, and there was this realization that the ancient concept that the soul has the ability to, uh, to manifest the form of the body through the attention of the soul became really clear to me in a way that I'd never experienced before. So my body has begun to change and the suffering is now very clear to me. It's all emotional, even the physical suffering. It's simply been resistance to that divinity, to that mm. light. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Finding, finding these caches of worthlessness that have been maintained by my poor little body. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, 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 yes. Um, you know, it's interesting. I just want to say, have you noticed too, that the more you have embodied and anchored in your body, it's affected the clarity of your seeing. Oh, yes. Because when you're just hanging out in the third eye, you know, I, there's one woman who's, she's a very interesting energy healer. And she says, you know, you're kind of, uh, how'd you put it, uh, not doomed, but, but you, you, having the ability to see visually is actually a problem because then your mind has to interpret yep. and you can't really trust that. So if you're sensing and then that sensing gives some vision, that's much more trustworthy and, um, uh, so I suspect you have found it has affected your capacity to see in, in ways that are very much more uh, beneficial. So much more. It's off the charts to, to be able to finally release myself from that constant desire to know, mm -hmm. surrendering to not knowing anything at all, 
and then being able to have a full body seeing experience now i can feel it i can there's feeling and there's the innate sort of natural knowing that's far beyond me that's a divine knowing that's right yeah yeah it's like you get more in touch i remember when i took some class i don't know a couple years back where they were talking about there are you know clear audience and clear <laughs> clairvoyance and clairsentience and, and then there's just direct knowing and i was like Boom! you know and th then it wasn't my mind it was my body just went oh, yep yeah, that's what i've been doing that's what i do and um and then i've heard that's the hardest one blah 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 but for some of us that's just kind of you know it's it's the clairsentience gives way to direct knowing that was my, ex my experience and you know physically yeah um, uh, what I'm working with right now is that I was born with, a, or I, in early years, I don't know, I, I was born with a little scoliosis. And this one amazing woman that I'm working with right now, um, she also was, and she used to get migraine. It must have been worse than mine because she used to get migraine headaches and things. But she healed that with pure attention and energy. And I always knew that was possible. And recently I felt like, it's happening, you know, just by really bringing focus in a way, I, I, I'm not quite sure what happened, but it, I, I had this moment of like, oh my God, this scoliosis is healing. It's gone right now. I can feel what it feels like when it's not here. And now, of course, I'm dealing with all the ramifications of that change in the body structure at the level of the bones. I mean, you know, it's, there's a little bit of pain involved because all these years of compensating for that, all the muscles and tendons and the, and the fascia. But this is the, maybe the final thing to, uh, I'd love to leave us, we're probably well over our time at this point, but there's an image that I was given when I was writing that piece about being in the chrysalis. And um, what I saw was when you, when you hold a new baby, when you hold, you know, when you have a, 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 a newborn or, you know, if it's somebody else's baby, maybe they're a week old or a couple of days old. But it's like this precious little vessel that is, the skin is kind of paper thin. And there really aren't muscles there yet. The, um, the only muscle that starts developing at the minute you're born is your diaphragm because you need it to cry. And crying is how you communicate. But it's like you can actually see and feel. And you know how babies, they, they have this smells, not mm -hmm. like rose petals, but it's its own kind of, whoa, boy, if they could bottle that, <laughs> I'm sure I'd make a fortune. Um, but you can actually see, almost see through their skin. And it's just liquid light, liquid light, love, you know? And it's, and it's not yet, it's in the process, it's in the chrysalis still. I mean, the outer form is here, the skull, there are bones, there are some, but you know, there's still a hole right here, right? <laughs> still connecting. <laughs> um, but you can, you can just feel that, the, that there's just this luminous light and it shines through their skin. I mean, they look luminous too. They have this luminous consciousness, but their physical is still representing that consciousness to a very large degree. And then as they grow, as we grow, you know, the bones and the muscles and the tendons and all those things develop and the personality structure is contributed to by the way we are treated, the way the big people treat us, which is the way we have conscripted them to do it because we have all come in knowing what we wanted, the challenges that we wanted to deal with. But what I was reminded of is that we at a cellular level remember what it was like to be like that. And we can bring that up we can bring up this sense of being so precious. You know, with a new baby, you just wanna, 
you, you, you know, you want to just hold it and you want to just drink in. And it's just this, you know, and puppies and kittens can be that way too. But, but since we're talking human, homo <laughs> luminous here, um, we have a cellular memory of that, each of us, even me at what, 72 years old. We, rem there is a part, there is a place, a level that remembers that. And if we can liken this chrysalis that we are in, which, you know, for the caterpillar who's going to evolve into a butterfly, it's just liquid, you know, amorphous, gelatinous stuff, that we have a part that is that available for creating something new. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, I, I think we can completely change the structures in our body, even at the level of the bones, which are the most dense, you could say. And I think having, just being reminded that we all have access to that memory is uh, really helpful. And it, it also is like, as above, so below, right? Chrysalis on the outside, chrysalis on the inside. Let's deal with it that way. Oh, thank you, Victoria. It's so precious, and <laughs> I feel it very deeply. Mm -hmm. so you're teaching a a course on embodiment coming up in mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So you're moving into um, late fall and early winter, um, and so people can come and learn more about your work and come in and join in with you on this journey, and um, and deepen into the mm -hmm. with you at your website emanation of org. is that correct right that is correct dot org yeah very long name i think sooner or later i'm gonna have to change it back to victoria org. that's a little easier <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah i'm going to well i'm going to offer a public call in a, about a week from tomorrow i have to get the announcement out soon uh to introduce the topic but what I really want to um, work with over, I'd like to start in uh, early October, like the first call will be October 12th. And the last call will be December, I don't know, around the 12th, not quite. But it, so it's just, you know, a little before the equinox and it'll be ending. It'll lead us into the, sum, the winter solstice um, here in the Northern Hemisphere. I doubt that I'll be back in the southern hemisphere at that point, so it'll be the winter solstice. And uh, it'll be like two calls a month and an online you know, Slack conference and all those things. But I really want to work with um, both the channels. Mm -hmm. There are channels, not just the Shoshimna. Well, the Shoshimna is the main one, but there are other channels. And there's a way to build circuitry. I mean, when we have blockages, really they're just areas where whatever wounding happened to us caused us to kind of store a little packet of whatever. Mm -hmm. And the circuitry can't, can't move through there. We can't welcome all of this information. Um, so, you know, the, the goal is to really come to into the the awareness of who we truly are and live that presence and um yeah so it's sort of like samadhi in the body as the body through the body <laughs> with the body all those things um there's that just rhymes <laughs> but but uh, yeah so i'll be i'll be offering that series uh it'll go you know about three months two calls each month and lots of online stuff and extra material and all of that because I really feel like this is the time and I know that these next couple of months are going to have lots going on on the outside that can be perceived and can, can be experienced energetically as challenging. So the more we can come back onto self, <laughs> the more instead of splaying our energy out into the object world, the more we can come into self, there's that uh, polarity in the um, 
one of the traditions, the subject object split, where we just come back into subject and there is no subject object split. The more we can do that, the more gracefully and easily and successfully we can actually harness the energies of ascension instead of being tossed about by the energies of rebellions and resistance and fear. So wow, that's, why, that's why now. <laughs> why now? Yeah. Well, my friends, you, you really should, if you can, take advantage of learning from Victoria because she's at her very peak at the moment and to be able to map to a mystic like her is a rare special opportunity and as you can see with her gentleness and her heart and her love she's going to help us ground deeply into this connect with Gaia connect with the divine find that light put our attention on it and make it bigger and anchor it all at the same time so thank you so much Victoria. thank you that's so sweet mm. namaste Namaste.